Oh, what a day it is. Right here in Ocala, Florida, I'm Jonathan Morris Schwartz, and welcome to the Jonathan Morris Schwartz My Manic Brain program. The show and the program and the podcast and the newsletter on Substack are all within the framework and context of my book, which is My Manic Brain, Jonathan Morris Schwartz, Sex, Politics, and Everlasting Life. These programs and the newsletter are all subdivisions and chapters and discussions and comments and explorations and philosophical discussions and social commentary within those three areas. So for the most part, all of what we discuss this year, 2021, is going to be, it's going to fit fairly neatly into either sex, politics, or everlasting life. The passion, the discussion of what the real meaning of our lives, how politics affects us on a daily basis, and of course, what role under sex, including passion, loyalty, betrayal, decisions that we make about gender, about sexuality, and perhaps most importantly, who, what, where, and when we determine which person enters our lives and whom we trust with our deepest, darkest secrets and our hearts and our souls. Today, today's show is going to focus from wonder to boredom to passion to sex. The first half of the show is going to explore what it is that gives us our brains, our manic brains, our chemistry. It's going to debate nature versus nurture to the extent of are we, are we born with a certain level of serotonin, a certain level of disposed neural function, whereas it's innate how manic or obsessive or compulsive or sympathetic or happy or serene we are. Is that something we're born with? Is it something we develop? Is it something we could change? Put bluntly, can an unhappy, cranky, disposed, baby and child and toddler turn into a happy-go-lucky, serene, peace-of-mind, calm adult, and vice versa. Today, we will begin with yesterday's newsletter in Substack. There is the Jonathan Morris Schwartz My Manic Brain free newsletter on Substack, which I encourage you to read and subscribe to and comment. I answer every comment personally and excitedly. So we begin with this discussion of our innate sense of who we are and we'll transition with this newsletter article that I wrote into once we have a sense of who we are, once we have a sense of how we feel, what passions in life do we obtain and achieve and acquire. The second part of the show will involve passion and sex and romance and how valuable that is to our psyche and to our peace of mind and serenity and happiness and how a certain element of manic, obsessive, compulsive uh, disposition and behavior and thought processing affects our passionate, romantic, sexual, love lives in general. But we're going to begin with what non-romantic or sexual desires and hobbies do we look forward to? What gets us out of bed in the morning? What do we look forward to doing? Do we like to hunt or fish? Do we sew? Do we paint? Do we do pottery? Do we enjoy watching television? Do we enjoy creating television? 
with social media? Are we videographers? Do we are we YouTubers? Do we enjoy a hobby of collecting game cards or sports cards and share that with others on the social digital media and gain extraordinary joy from that endeavor and hobby? What is it that makes us enjoy each day to the fullest as if it is indeed our last? And we will additionally explore and discuss when we started out as young children, two, three, four years of age, and had our first memory and our first sense of time and space, which was living minute by minute, hour by hour, and, and how at some point, perhaps around kindergarten, give or take a year or two, we started to develop life's anxieties. Our sense of, of time and space changed. We no longer were able to get excited minute by minute, hour by hour, like in preschool and kindergarten when the teacher said, it's almost time for playground time, and, and that was all we cared about until that was over, and she said, it's almost time for lunch, and then we were enthralled and excited and breathlessly doing our dance over the next activity, and now it's time for arts and crafts. We, many of us, would rediscover that kind of hour-by-hour hour surrender to whatever, surrender and enjoy and make the best of whatever activity is next during summer camp. When, you know, in school, it's all about learning, education, uh, reading, testing, grades. But in the summer, if we were fortunate enough to go to day or sleep away summer camp, many times some of our fondest memories of our, of, are of those times because it brought us back to preschool and kindergarten when you didn't really have a care in the world other than whether it was kickball or softball or go-karts or kayaking or sailing or cooking um, or dancing or watching a movie or creating a play, singing, dancing, photography. It was all designed to be a summer of, of wonder and it almost didn't matter what was on the schedule because whatever it was you were going to enjoy and make the best of. And if you didn't love a particular activity, there was another one an hour later that you would. So let's talk about finding our passion with the newsletter Jonathan Moore Schwartz, My Manic Brain, entitled Snips and Snails, Sugar and Spice. What are little boys made of? Snips and snails and puppy dog tails, that's what little boys are made of. What are little girls made of? Sugar and spice and everything nice. That's what little girls are made of. We all remember that nursery rhyme written in the early 1800s. But what, what, are, what are we made of? Well, we could debate nature versus nurture, but most agree our innate brain chemistry is largely responsible for our personality, motivation, energy level, and life-determining decisions. Like a, like a pie chart, we are the sum of many characteristics. Manic compulsion with serenity to balance things out, paranoia tempered with introspection, anxiety, contentment, depression, euphoria, introspection, narcissism, happiness. If we're dealt a biological chemical deck of cards at birth, how do we prepare for life's ups and downs? How do we make the best of each day by finding and exploiting our passions? How do we get through life's mundane, fearful, terrifying moments? How do we process trauma and tragedy and debility and death? Well, before video cameras, you know, home movies were, were filmed using 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter cameras. Families of the 60s and 70s, they viewed their children's birthday partings, parties, weddings, vacations, and anniversaries on a white screen projected from a film projector with no sound. And with everyone's mouths moving unintelligibly, arm, hand, body, and particularly facial gestures were magnified on these home movies. 
Young children, even babies, revealed their personalities, dispositions, and what they were made of at a very young age. Perhaps to some extent, we are stuck with our innate brain chemistry in the same way we're stuck with genetic predispositions like heart disease, cancer, hypertension, and diabetes. Yet everyone experiences peace of mind, contentment, euphoria, and happiness. We can't judge every book by its cover, but can we be nurtured into an appreciation of life's beauty and wonder and promise? How do we prepare for life, make the best of each day, find our true passion, and exploit it? What if your passion is self-destructive, like smoking or drinking, doing drugs, or binging on sugar? Well, in a free country, particularly one where the Constitution provides the explicit right to pursue happiness, people have the right to pick their poisons, and if someone chooses a lifestyle that shortens their lifespan, as long as they're not harming anyone else, that's their decision to make. Interventions are occasionally successful, but the truth is... Almost nobody stops a behavior because someone approaches them and says, you know, fill in the blank you're doing is not good for you or can harm you or can kill you. Everyone has to find their own pathway, make their own decisions, and live with the consequences thereof. As we know, not everyone who engages in smoking, drinking, and drugs uh, ends up dying young. Not everyone who is healthy and lives a pure, abstinent lifestyle lives to be a 100. That being said, we are the freest country in the world, and the Constitution allows us to live as such, and hopefully it'll stay that way. How do you find your passion? How do you find something that you look forward to regardless of what it brings to you in materialistic benefit or otherwise? Well, just as we insist there is someone for everyone when it comes to love, if you explore and experiment enough, you're going to find activities, hobbies, and endeavors that enrich your life and don't usually kill you. Watercolor, acrylic, oil painting, writing, Kite flying, I love to fly a kite, remote control cars and planes, videography, sewing, pottery, crafts, singing, cooking, inventing, tinkering around the backyard, making a fort, teaching, caregiving, gardening, fishing, boating, and yes, consuming social and digital media while watching endless shows on Netflix and other streaming channels absolutely counts as a passion if it makes you happy. If when you open your eyes in the morning, the thought of pursuing your passion motivates you to jump out of bed, you have found it. Of course, your passions will change and evolve, but a true passion is a gift to yourself, a wonderful personal indulgence. Your most powerful passion is when you crave and enjoy the process, not just the product. When you keep creating original paintings despite never selling one. When you keep producing videos despite having no viewers when you create culinary delights even when nobody is delighted, when you write poems, novels, and screenplays despite endless rejection letters, when you keep playing tennis, racquetball, billiards, ping pong, or golf despite losing every time, when you post pithy tweets, pictures of your family events, when you water, fertilize, trim, and sing to your plants even if they wither and die away, even if you take awkward selfies despite not getting any likes or comments. Perhaps someday your passion will be celebrated as exciting and popular. Perhaps someday you will reap monetary benefits from something you create. But if nobody ever sees or hears or tastes or appreciates your heartfelt contributions and you keep doing it, you have found your passion. Your passion is for you. We are dealt a biological chemical deck of cards predisposing us to a range of emotions from manic to sedate. We'll all face a time, either slowly or abruptly, when our physical abilities will deteriorate or disappear, and hopefully we will face our own demise with grace and dignity and strength. In the meanwhile, let's celebrate everything, the vivid colors of a rainbow, the fragrant richness of a rose, the chewy, gooey deliciousness, deliciousness of a warm slice of pizza, 
a passionate kiss, but most of all, may we never lose that child from our home movies, the one who had no concept of time or space, the child who had no idea they'd grow into a parent or a husband or a wife, the child who never spent a single second wondering how they were going to pay their bills, the child for whom a pinwheel, a coloring book, an ice cream cone, or a bubble bath was the greatest moment in their lives, the child who knew they had to seize the day, not because they thought it might be their last, but because they instinctively knew the power of the moment. The child who didn't have to search for their passion because every new experience took their breath away. Be that five-year-old within you with an open palm of desire and an urgency for adventure when an hour was a lifetime. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to write a book no one will ever read, post something on Facebook nobody will ever appreciate, and sing a song nobody wants to hear. Why? Because that's what little boys are made of. Transitioning now from finding our passion and within the context and realm of everlasting life, uh, this is Jonathan Morris Schwartz. Thank you for watching my program. Those of you just joining, this all stems from my manic brain, Sex, Politics, and Everlasting Life, book available on Amazon.com, both in paperback an electronic, electronic version, $2.99. It'll be the best 63 chapters you can buy for that amount of money. It'll bring you lots of joy, interesting discussion, blow your mind a little bit. Again, it is for young adults to adulthood, not for young children, nor is the following part of the program where we now transition from the notion of what is what are we made of? What is our disposition? Is it nature? Are we born happy or sad or manic or obsessive or compulsive? Do we acquire a certain level of control? In other words, do we make ourselves happy? Is happiness within our control? To what degree are we a victim of our brain chemistry? To what degree can we overcome, change, find strategies to enjoy this biological life and explore the possibility of an everlasting cosmic existence of some kind? We know that part of enjoying life are non-romantic, non-sexual hobbies, endeavors, as we discussed. A lot of people jump out of bed because they're excited about creating their next YouTube video or their next painting or the fort they're building out of old tires and plywood in the backyard or the garden they're growing. But it would be disingenuous, wrong, and avoiding the truth, if we didn't also explore, discuss, exploit, enjoy the notion that a, a good chunk of what makes our, our lives here on Earth, our biological meat puppet protein selves, worthwhile, and for many, a big reason about getting out of bed in the morning is because we want to share this life, the wonder of this world, with our girlfriend or boyfriend or spouse or children or lover or classmates or colleagues. But this next part of the show, we're going to explore two chapters from My Manic Brain, and we're going to focus on what every 14, 15, 16-year-old finds out, discovers when they ride 
the Himalaya at that local youth fair carnival that we all know about because, oh, the euphoria of the Himalaya. Almost every traveling carnival has that wonderful ride, oftentimes called the Himalaya, a circular roller coaster track surrounded and encased in colorful, psychedelically painted, creaky wood platforms and enormously oversized speakers blaring the kind of hard rock that makes your chest burst. Always a tattoo-loaded, recently released, greasy-haired, dark-eyed, brooding, angry young man takes your ticket and ushers you off toward an empty cart. If you're lucky, you hooked up on one of the wild, eccentric, you hooked up with one of the wild, eccentric, too tight jeaned, filthy but sexy, scandaled, halter topped, blue eye shadowed, horny before her time, bursting with prepubescent, unbridled, untamed, barely contained sexual energy girls. A girl who ate just enough cotton candy and grilled caramelized onion sausage hoagies for her face and mouth and teeth to exude a greasy, wild attractiveness attractiveness, not enough to puke on the ride, but just enough to hold on to you, to squeeze your arm, to kiss your cheek, to rub your neck and her breast against your shoulder, just enough carbs for her sugar high to cause her to lose her inhibitions. If lucky, the boy sat on the right side of the buggy, and as the speed increased and the music pulsated and the carny screamed unintelligible nonsense over the loudspeaker, his carnival dream girl's body pushed harder and stronger against his a forced but delicious merging of bodies, a whiff of her sugary breath, and a quick stolen head-bobbing kiss as the Himalaya slows to a crawl, then a complete stop, then reverses itself with an indescribably exhilarating take-your-breath-away, head-splitting euphoria when the ride ends grabbing his wild child girl by the hand and wobbling off the creaky wooden ramp onto the dusty, rocky ground. Stumbling around power cords, they race off toward the haunted house, sneaking off behind the portable toilets and making out, slipping purple-stained tongues into each other's mouths, giggling, smirking, racing off to another ride, sharing an ice cream cone, knowing that night was going to be a one-time event, knowing it would mostly be a fantasy within each of their own minds and heads, knowing the physical connection and passion was being artificially fueled by the flashing strobe lights, the blaring rock music, the smell of candy apples, propane-grilled hot dogs, cigarette smoke, and sexual desire. When the ride, when his ride home arrived and he was forced to leave his carnival chick, she grabbed him close, kissed him so strongly and fiercely and seductively he barely could contain himself. As she finishes the grand kiss of goodbye, they slowly let their hands unlace and he scattered away. The memory of that night will linger longer than some of his consummated love affairs. Oh, the power of that Himalaya. One of the reasons that so many people end up landing in the first part of the show where we spoke of non-romantic, non-passionate, oftentimes passions and hobbies and joys that can, that can be done and enjoyed individually, art, pottery, videography, social media, watching television, cooking, gardening, cleaning, organizing, building a fort. All of those passions and endeavors and joys, they can be painful when your garden dies or your cake is burnt or your painting sucks. But nothing compares to the risk we take when we fall in love, when we give our heart, when we put in that basket of what makes our life worthwhile and enjoyable, another person loving us back. And there is, as we know, a love addiction, a love cancer, a, a pain of loss. And speaking of brain chemistry, we all know that there are some cases of lost love, some Ro Romeo and Juliet type cases, where there is no getting over it, where for the rest of our lives, we end up wondering what we could have done to make it last. Of course, most rebound back 
either literally or figuratively, and find romance and love again. But there is almost no pain of losing someone, particularly when you're of the mindset that you can't live without them, even though we can and we do. The joy of victory, the agony of defeat, victory. Are humans the only species to achieve an orgasm? And what the heck is an orgasm? A million doves being released? A squeezing, erupting, tingling, tickling, physical, emotional, and spiritual release? How does our bodies know how to achieve one? 50 strokes, 100, intense, speedy friction, slow, rhythmic, motion of the ocean, sensuality, mental gymnastics? Is it cheating to achieve an orgasm by imagining your neighbor or a celebrity or the actor from the porn you just watched? At about the age of 10, in the twilight between the time his head hit the pillow at night and he fell into unconsciousness, he would create an imaginary little girl in his mind. His imagination would start with a nebulous body, then long blonde hair, blue eyes, and his body reacted physiologically to this cerebral apparition fluttering and prancing and giggling. In his prepubescent state, he experienced a sudden rush of blood and a profound euphoria which ebbed and flowed as he manipulated his virtual girl friend. One night in his mind, the pretty girl kissed him and he felt it. He knew nothing about an erection or French kissing or orgasms or anything other than knowing there was a mysterious, magical sensation he had never felt before. He knew on some level that if he, if he could turn himself on by simply simulating a vision of a completely fabricated sweetie, then the real thing must be magnificent. For a myriad of reasons, sex comes easier to some than others. Some instinctively separate the physical from the emotional from the spiritual. Many from a young age are self-confident in their physical selves and fearless enough to know sex is animalistic, dirty, inspiring, burn down the house, life-changing, yet oftentimes nothing at all. After the release, it's meaningless, fleeting. The thought of it. The imagery, the fantasy, the confirmed mutual attraction is what mattered above all else. The concept of expressing an attraction, a connection, an inexplicable transition from starting to touching to gently slowly merging, lips instinctively parting, tongue stroking, mysterious experimentation, wondering whether, wondering whether there can be only one, a true love, and if so, can making love be as explosive the second, third, and one hundredth time? Once deep, passionate kissing and rubbing and touching and burning the house down happens, how delicious and unbearable the wait until it mysteriously happens again. And that indeed is victory, but defeat. Defeat. Oh God, oh dear Lord, he's not going to make it from the minute he wakes up his First waking thought is of her face, her kiss, her skin, her professing her love. Every second of every minute of every day of every month, his brain tortures him endlessly. From the moment he wakes up to the moment he tries to sleep, her smell, her words, her voice, her love, her promises, her essence, her joy, her smile, her smirk, her idiosyncrasies danced and pranced and itched and promised and slowly ebbed away as if being punished. She swore to God she would love him forever. She wrote love letters that would make angels blush and wince and cry. She cried with love. She panted with love. But in the end, the fear, the insecurity proved true. Her love seeped away. Not a sudden death, but a slow, sad, unfear, unfair, uncontrollable slipping away. Nobody, not a single soul could ever replace the whole, the void, the infinite emptiness, the pain, the complete inability to conceive of how to go on. For over a year, he couldn't recall a single moment of mental peace, just an endless, repetitive loop in his psyche, recalling and repeating memories and reinventing every phoneme, every glance, every word, every decision, as if he could somehow isolate and fix where he went wrong or say or do something different that would have preserved her love. His soul was crushed, kidnapped, and imprisoned and punished mercilessly. Over time, like the person who quits smoking or drinking or drugs, a semblance of comfort and joy does indeed return. 
but the thought of her always lurks in the shadows and alleys, and while self-control and perseverance can prevail, in moments of weakness, even a fleeting thought drags him back into a living hell of unattainable desire. For some, uh, sex is recreational. There are many who claim they've never had the kind of soul-changing, soul-enriching, merging of two souls kind of sex where it's deeper, more spiritual than the flesh. For some, sex is never recreational. Sex is reserved for someone with whom there is a depth, a relationship, more than a one-night stand or a quickie or something superfluous. For some, sex is strictly for procreation. Sex is just for making a baby, for starting a family. It's neither recreational nor life soul changing, spirit changing, a merging of two spirits. But what everyone can agree on is sex is hilarious. Ten reasons sex is the greatest thing in the world. Number one, it is mysterious. Number two, it is predictable. Number three, it is powerful. Number four, it feels good. Number five, achieving an orgasm is superhuman. Number six, providing someone else with an orgasm is enormously empowering. Number seven, mutual attraction is magical. Number eight, when it is good, it makes world peace seem possible. Number nine, it makes you feel young. Number ten, it burns calories. Ten things that go wrong during sex. Number one, a Tinder notification. Number two, the dick slips out and painfully rams her crotch. She says, ouch. Number three, he achieves orgasm. She does not, refuses to fake it, and after a while, he just stops, dejected. Number four, someone knocks on the door. Number five, someone farts. Number six, the vagina farts. It's always the dick's fault. Number seven, a leg cramp. Number eight, you gotta pee. Number nine, you or your partner dies. That's a bummer. Number 10, the dog decides to join. (laughs) 10 reasons to never have sex again. Number one, you're too old. Number two, you cannot achieve an erection despite the largest dose of Viagra. Number three, you just do not want a flesh and blood dick inside you anymore. Number four, ice cream is better. Number five, smoking marijuana is all you really need. Number six, a decent Netflix show is preferable. Number seven, Masturbation just works better. Number eight, cold macaroni and cheese. Mm -hmm. Number nine, sleep. And number ten, it's just too much work. And ten reasons to never, never, ten reasons to never marry someone for whom you are extremely attracted. Number one, crazy out of control love and passion cannot last. Number two, that is what affairs are for. (laughs) Number three, companionship lasts, sex does not. Number four, friendship masqueraded as true love can last a lifetime. Number five, we all age out of our sexiness. Number six, children change everything. Number seven, money ultimately matters more. Number eight, it will hurt less when cheated on. Number nine, bodily functions like burping, farting, and incontinence will not matter so much. And number ten, if we live long enough, ugly becomes cute. Thank you for joining this episode of Jonathan Morris Schwartz's My Manic Brain, Sex, Politics, and Everlasting Life. The book is indeed available on Amazon.com. The podcast is available on Podbean, Google, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and wherever wonderful podcasts are broadcast. And please subscribe not only to this YouTube channel, but to my free every other day newsletter on the wonderful website, Substack. They have an app as well. 
And that is where the seeds of a lot of this discussion on sex politics and everlasting life are birthed or sprouted. And so love to hear your comments. Thank you so much for watching. And oh, what a day it is. Bye-bye, everybody.